Uh, let me first introduce uh, Elizabeth Boyce. Uh, she is a licensed clinical social worker who provided direct care for people living with HIV AIDS from 87 to 1996, came to Los Angeles County Department of Health Services in 1991 and provided that direct care at LA County USC Medical Center. In 96, she shifted her focus to administration and management of social service programs for vulnerable populations. She's worked at LA County's Office of AIDS Programs and Policy from 96 to 04 and ultimately became the manager of that program, overseeing 88 HIV, AIDS, social service, and mental health contracts. In 94, she transferred to the Health Services Administration where she began the Homeless Services Unit, which she currently manages. And this is um, Elizabeth Boyce. Welcome. Thank you. Next to her is uh, Dr. Alonzo Plow, who is Vice President of Program Planning and Evaluation at the California Endowment. And if you don't know what the California Endowment, he's gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, prior to joining the endowment, Dr. Plow was the Director and Health Officer for Seattle and King County Department of Public Health. Dr. Plow is also an Associate Professor of Health Services at the University of Washington School of Public Health and Community Medicine. Previously, Dr. Plow was Deputy Commissioner and Director of Public Health at Boston Department of Health and Hospitals, a lecturer on health policy and management at Harvard, I've never heard of that place, and an Associate Professor of Graduate Programs in Urban and Environment, Environmental Policy. He serves on all kinds of different boards. I'll just mention a couple of them. One is the National Association of City and County Health Officials, the American Lung Association of Washington, United Way of King County, the Washington Dental Foundation. He's also chairman of the Board of Education Development Center, Inc., and chair of the Advisory Committee of the King County Action Plan. Next to him, we have Mr. Marvin Southard. Uh, he, Dr. Souther joined the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health as director in 1998, before which he served in a similar capacity at Kern County for five years. In his present role, <coughs> Dr. Souther leads the largest public mental health system in the country, probably one of the largest in the world. He's serving over 200,000 clients annually and is one of the most ethnically diverse counties in the nation, as you all know, since you've been studying this. And his, uh, the individual budget in his department is $1 billion. We're not talking about the county budget. We're talking about the budget in his department. Uh, Dr. Southard is the 2006 Social Worker of the Year for the National Association of Social Workers, the California chapter. He's been a recipient of all kinds of different awards. He's been in all kinds of different different uh, associations, too many of them to, for us to name right here, but he is a uh, licensed clinical social worker. He received his master's degree in social work from UC Berkeley, after which he completed his postgraduate studies in social work at UCLA. Uh, next to him at the end, I've already mentioned uh, Diana Bonta. Uh, she is the former director of the California Department of Health Services and currently is Vice President of Public Affairs for Kaiser Permanente Southern California Region. Uh, Dr. Bonta is responsible for the region's public policy agenda, leadership and oversight of public affairs programs, branding support and reputation management. Dr. Bonta is a seasoned healthcare executive with strong public policy credentials. Prior to joining Kaiser Permanente, California Governor Gray Davis appointed her to lead the state's Department of Health Services to address critical health issues and protection programs for the state's 35 million residents. She was instrumental in enhancing California's preparedness for potential bioterrorism, including the smallpox vaccination program and the California Health Alert Network. She designed nurse to patient ratios, she restructured the state's vital record system and created a model pharmacy discount program for senior. She's been recognized for her contributions with numerous awards and Dr. Bonta received the American Public Health Association Presidential Citation Award. And the Hispanic magazine named her to its list of the 100 leading Latinas. She has been nominated for or appointed to more than 24 governance and advisory positions and is on the board of trustees for the Health Professions Education Foundation. She also served as the director of health programs for the city of Long Beach. And that, uh, kind of looking at your resume, talking about Kaiser Permanente, being the top health official in the state of California, being the top health official in the city of Long Beach, kind of explain to us the governance in terms of the role that government plays in health. 
uh, the, the distinction between the counties and the states, and why does the city of Long Beach have a health department, but not the city of Los Angeles? Be happy to, Fernando. I, I want to start, though, with a shout out to LMU, especially since my son went here, and that's because Central City Association today honored LMU as a treasure of Los Angeles. So congratulations to all the students and to you, Fernando, and all the staff. Well, let me talk a little bit about, uh, I worked for the city of Long Beach, as Fernando said, and um, I worked for a great boss there, um, uh, Jim Hankla, and uh, historically, as Dr. Plow um, headed up the health department in the Boston area, uh, health departments were centered at the city level. In California, however, over the years, there has been a change in roles in which the counties became the unit of government to take on the responsibilities for health care. In California, there are kind of three renegade cities, the city of Long Beach, the city of Pasadena, and the city of Berkeley. And they kept their own health department. So I had the privilege of serving as director of the health department in Long Beach for almost 11 years. It's a rather small department in comparison to uh, the county of Los Angeles and to the state. But relative to most other health departments in the United States, it was fairly large, with about 450 staff members. When I started there in 1988, it had a budget of 30 million. When I left in 99, it was 300 million. Sake of comparison, and I, I know that Marvin can talk about LA County and Libya as well, but uh, when I went to the state of California, the budget there, just for the Department of Health Services for the state of California, was $32 billion. And it took me a while to not say million and to get the word billion out because it was so <laughs> enormous. But it included California's Medicaid program, Medi-Cal. So it, it was huge. Health departments have really taken a distinct change since 9-11. Previous to that, most of the focus had been on um, you know, food surveillance, um, immunizations, sexually transmitted infections, a whole host of very vital and important um, infrastructure, testing of water, beaches, et cetera. But post 9-11 added to a very um, intense challenges that they face on a daily basis. It's also preparedness for the potential of the um, flu epidemic, um, uh, potentials for uh, certainly um, terrorism activities, and they have been very much an integral part of changing how we look at public health and how we look at government service in relationship to communities. At Kaiser, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me now to be able to take my experience in the, in the public sector, join that in the private sector, but we're a not-for-profit at Kaiser, so it's very closely aligned. And what we're looking at is certainly our mantra is preventive health services. So, um, Dr. Souther, you're director of LA County Department of Mental Health. Tell us, the, I mean, most of us know, but just make the distinction between mental health and the rest of the department and what you do there and what are the major policy issues that you've been uh, pursuing this past year. Okay, great. I think I'll also build on uh, Libby's uh, observation. In, uh, in California, m mental health services are for the most part delivered by counties. There's two, reneg two renegade groups uh, in California. One again is the city of Berkeley, but Los Angeles County also has the other renegade, which are the cities of Pomona, Laverne, and Claremont, which form their own mental health authority and so forth. All other purposes, they're a part of the county of Los Angeles, except for mental health, in which they're then, are their own authority. And what about Long Beach and Pasadena? Do they participate they are, in the for mental health purposes? Mm -hmm. They're a part of my department. Okay. So, so uh, throughout California, there are various organizational structures, but mental health services are paid for and organized. These are public mental health services I'm talking about because until say 1960, there was no public mental health service in LA County. If you had a mental health problem and you had enough money or you had insurance, you went to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and got the services that you could get. Uh, since 1960, in the last 50 years, the majority of mental health services that are offered in LA County are now through the public system. In some areas, you can get a lot better care 
for certain kinds of illnesses through the public system than you could if you were a millionaire and had your own resources, just because of the way that things are organized. So my job, to answer your question in Los Angeles County, is that I am responsible for the planning and supervision and implementation of public mental health services. That includes emergency services, such as when somebody is a danger to themselves or others and needs a 5150 and an emergency team comes and takes them uh, against their will to a hospital, or outpatient services. The county runs 65 different service sites throughout L LA County, but the majority of the work that we provide, we provide through community agencies. So we contract out the majority of what we do. So of our uh, billion, $100 million budget, about $600 million of that we contract to community agencies. So uh, D.D. Hirsch, that's down on Sepulveda here, operates on a contract with us, for example. And uh, the policy issues that we have been wrestling with most thoroughly right now is that mental health is in a very weird situation. Mental Health Services Act passed in November 2004, and that has given us a huge amount of new money. For LA County, when all of the pieces of the plan get rolled out, it will be a, a, approximately an additional $250 million a year for various parts of the plan that we need to develop that I hope to tell you more about later. But at the same time we're getting that new money in, that new money is for new programs. We can't use it to support anything that has existed in the past. So at the same time we're getting, on the right hand, we're getting a bunch of new money in, our costs and our caseloads have risen dramatically, particularly for indigent care, and so we have faced a shortfall. So we're, we are adding staff and services and programs, and we are cutting the ability to provide certain kinds of services to indigents. And it's in a, we're currently in a very weird situation because we provide uh, indigent services for people who have a serious and persistent mental illness, anybody who's in an emergency. But if somebody came to us and they don't have health insurance and they don't have Medicaid or they don't have Medicare, and they came to us for services and they have a mild mental illness, we are in the really stupid and paradoxical situation of having to tell them, wait, come back, wait till you're really sick, then you can come back and we can help you. And so that kind of situation really has caused a real difficulty and paradox for my staff because we historically have had a situation in which it's been our desire to provide services by need, not by payer source. In other words, we'd provide the same level of service according to somebody who needed it, whether they had Medicaid or Medicare or they had no insurance, no payer source. So, but the analogy is a little bit like um, the trauma centers or, or emergency rooms where a lot of people go to emergency rooms, just they don't really have an emergency, but they have to go there because they have no other outlet. And so you're treating them in an emergency room where you're supposed to be really sick, but you're not. And you're not capable of doing that, though, when they have, you said, not so severe, but uh, you, so you can't re- um, uh, assign them that they are in fact severe to start treating them or you can't play that game. Well, no, like the and, the re and the reason is simply resources. The only way we could make room for those, we could see them if we had enough resources, uh -huh. but since we don't have enough resources, the only way we could add these new less ill people is tell my staff, discharge those really sick so, people that you're already helping to make room for the new right. ones. So it's not a policy issue, it is a resource issue. So what is, how does a typical person that you see come into uh, interaction with you? How, how, do you? how do they first enter the system? The typical person that we see uh, comes into one of our directly operated clinics or programs and wants help for something. Uh, usually they're probably- So, so they, they themselves or their families go, they're not taken there by other right, type of authorities. Right. The, the involuntary treatment, though it's an important part of our system, is still the minority the minority of clients come in, in on an involuntary basis. We also are currently also, uh, another thing that drives the mental health system are legal issues. So for example, there's a, uh, a case that uh, LA County settled that's called the KDA case, 
which requires LA County to provide a certain level of mental health services for foster youth. And so basically, foster youth have an entitlement to any mental health service that they might need. So we're building our network mm -hmm. to be able to provide that kind of care. We're currently starting to do, to avoid a lawsuit, a similar thing that you probably read of about in the paper for juvenile justice kids, so that when kids get taken to a juvenile hall or juvenile facility right now, the first thing that happens to them is they get a mental health evaluation to see if they need mental health treatment or mental health treatment as a part of whatever they're gonna go through. And the, one of the oddest things is that in, in the federal, state, and county systems, substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment are divorced from one another. They're separate systems funded in separate ways, and, and yet, if you have friends, you know that a lot of the people who have really bad addiction problems also have a mental health problem, and the research shows that unless you deal with both of those things together, people don't get well. And so there are policy implications mm -hmm. for the way our structures drive services. Well, I mean, this is really frustrating, I think, for the students who are first really being introduced to this, and you're telling us, you, everybody recognizes the link. We all, I think, recognize it intuitively. The research recognizes it. Why don't we do it? <laughs> is it just politics, or just the way laws are written? Well, it, it's politics, laws well, are written, and there's, there's another component, which is the... Well, but let me stop you yeah, on the politics. Sure. If it's politics, it's usually that somebody's interests is uh, uh, in a way that the laws are written because it interests somebody this way. Who does it interest to have this distinction and this separation? Well, the, uh, speaking specifically about the alcohol and drug and mental health separation, right. it's be one of the big drivers is stigma. Uh, my wife runs a homeless outreach program in another county, and so she does these groups f for homeless people. One of the things she asked them was, uh, if you had a choice of being classified as an addict or mentally ill, which would you choose? Universally, they chose addict. They would be prefer to be seen as an addict rather than as somebody suffering from mental illness. So one of the things that drives the difference is, is the stigma that all of us, mm -hmm. to one degree or another, have. And our attitudes towards people with substance abuse are attitudes towards people with mental illness. That's one of, the, one of the drivers of the politics and so forth. Another silly one is just organizational culture. You know, the substance abuse treatment culture grew up in a particular way, mental health in another way. You put them together and sometimes they fight. So, I mean, some of it is as silly as that. You know, it's been kind of a, um, constantly people talk about and tying in homeless and bringing Elizabeth in that one of the reasons that the homeless population greatly increased because sometime back in the 60s, uh, Ronald Reagan closed the mental health uh, um, hospitals and all these people had some, nowhere to go. Is, is that a myth? Is there reality to that? What, what happened with that? There's, there, there is truth to that, but it's also... Um, and what is There's the two sides of that. One side of it, yes, that's true. There were people who are now homeless who uh, used would in the past have been in state mental institutions. And do the, we blame, flip, can, we, can we blame Ronald Reagan for that? Well, in part, yes, in part. And mm. the flip side of that, though, is, and this is the civil liberties side, most people who were in those state institutions would prefer to be in the street than back in those state institutions. It's not like those state institutions were paradise. So, I mean, Camarillo, if you go there now, looks beautiful. But if you went there when there were patients there and talked to people who lived through that experience, they wouldn't recommend it. So while we, we can say, so the truth really is that when we closed the state hospitals, we didn't allow the resources that were associated with those state hospitals to flow to the community. And that we can blame Reagan for. Elizabeth. Yes. Is it true that people would rather be homeless than be in a mental hospital? I know it's a generalization, it's one of those unfair questions, but there it is. I think that there certainly are a lot of folks that would, would say that, and I think uh, what Dr. Southerd brings up 
is is very true. I mean, the conditions uh, are not are not fun, not pretty, and there's a lot more flexibility and uh, freedom mm -hmm. uh, on the streets. Absolutely. So, what's the solution to homelessness? I know that's another general question, but it, it's sort of like is is this an intractable problem that will just never will always have homeless with us? Is it a matter of degrees? Is it the economy? Is it uh, what are the issues there? I think it will be with us always to some degree. Um, the solution is housing and services. Um, and in, in, you know, even if we had all the housing and all the services uh, that LA needs, there will definitely be folks that will be in and out of homelessness uh, due to you know, multiple factors, multiple complex psychosocial issues, mental health issues, substance using issues. Um, so, you know, there certainly are better solutions, and um, but it's not something that will ever completely go away. So do you kind of have, a, out of every 100 homeless, like how many are men, how many are women, how many are children, how many are families, how many are mentally ill, how many are on, on drugs? Do you have data like that? I have it. I don't have it readily Well, online. just generally, make it up. They won't even know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the numbers on women are about 20%. So 20% uh, of the homeless are women. Well, I think. Uh -huh. I think it's about that. And I'm basing that on Lhasa's uh, homeless count in 2005. We just did another homeless count, and we don't have those figures as of yet. Um, and, you know, lots of different data tells you lots of different information. You have some data that says about up to between 30% to 70% are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the numbers. Like I said, it just depends on what your data source is. So what's the size of your budget? My budget? Or the, for, in terms of addressing homelessness in LA County, LA City, how much money does, do, does government spend in addressing this issue? I don't have an exact number for you. Make it up, I just um, don't know. The, you know, it, it would be very hard to quantify, it's mm -hmm. not impossible, but uh, just for example, in Department of Health Services where, uh, you know, I cover, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have about 300, 400 homeless in our hospitals during, you know, a 30-day period. So uh, if we really were able to quantify that, obviously it would vary month to month, but it's very substantial amount of investment. So how, what are the services that are offered to the homeless? Uh, is it temporary housing? Is it food? Is it clothing? Uh, shelter? How, how, what, is that, what is the most specific need that they have on a day-to-day -day basis? And then in the long term, how do we try to address that at the individual level? Well, I can speak to the health component. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I cover. Um, you know, we provide uh, inpatient care. We provide emergency care. We provide outpatient care in our department. Uh, we, I don't know if you know, but the public health and Department of Health Services actually split last July. So public health is in another office, and I cover the facilities, which means that we're responsible for the inpatient, the outpatient, and the emergency usage um, of our ER systems. And um, I, was, I came on in 2004, really to, although we provide services to homeless, indigent uh, clients, there was nobody who was really looking at specifically the homeless issues and how the homeless access our services. And so when I came on, we didn't really do anything differently than uh, for any other client. Uh, but what I've been able to do is build um, a lot of different programs to address some of the very um, important issues such as more access to SSI. We now have an S SSI outreach project where we have... Tell them what SSI is. Um, supplement, supplemental security income. It's for folks uh, who are disabled and need some income. Um, and it's a federal program and it there's general relief, which is for people who, who um, are not disabled and are homeless are generally uh, eligible for general relief. It's about 200 something dollars a month, which as any of you know, trying to pay a rent for that amount mm -hmm. of money is impossible. So SSI is more closer to uh, about $800 a month. So we certainly want those people homeless who are disabled to have access to those funds. Mm -hmm. So we have a project in Department of Health Services. We have a bunch of housing projects where we're looking at housing as an intervention in terms of decreasing the utilization of health services. We don't want people to use emergency services. We want them to have a regular primary care provider just like anybody else. So those are some of the areas we're really trying to um, uh, find more resource opportunities. We're also bringing on more recuperative care. If you get sick and you go to the hospital and maybe you get discharged and you somebody needs to take care of you, you need a little caretaking, you go home. Your spouse, your child, 
your whatever takes care of you, homeless obviously are really vulnerable. So we um, have facilities that take care of folks for a period of time so they can further convalesce, even though they don't need hospital care anymore. So a lot of these programs, uh, you know, we've been, been able to bring to Department of Health Services. The Chief Administrative Office of the county also has put $100 million um, uh, to bring on more resources and housing and so on for, for homeless, which is that a really, one-time thing or a yearly? There's 15 million is ongoing. The rest is one-time only. However, uh, I do believe we're researching each one-time only project and going to look at those, and then probably some of those will continue to be funded. Okay. Dr. Plow, the California Endowment. Students, I think, need to know what that is, its origins, how to get started. It's got a beautiful brand-new building on Alameda. But what is someone like you? a practitioner who was in doing this work and now kind of in a foundation think tank. Well, what's the transition like and what did they hire you to do? Okay. Well, let me tell you first a little bit about the California Endowment and that'll help explain why I, I made the transition there. California Endowment celebrated its 10th anniversary this year and it's a statewide foundation that actually came out of a change that Blue Cross of California made about 10 years ago when they wanted to move from nonprofit uh, to for-profit status, uh, and the state attorney general required that some of the, the, the resources that they had that were generated under their nonprofit status move into uh, this foundation. That's a very long, complicated story that... Just uh, very generically, though, why would someone want to move from a nonprofit to a profit? What, what, <laughs> what did it... Uh, did it provide more health services? What was the rationale? For, from the perspective of, and these are called, uh, what the California Endowment is called a conversion foundation. Mm -hmm. And around the country, there have been a number of hospitals and health systems that have made this conversion from being nonprofit to for profit. The decision, of, the, the decision that they make is usually based on a business decision that uh, coming out of some of the constraints of being a nonprofit and being able to develop for profit subsidiaries and penetrate different markets in different ways, that they can essentially do better in a business case, um, and I would hope that that doing better was serving people better as well uh, in a for-profit status versus a non-profit status. But all around the country, when those conversions happen, uh, those dollars uh, generally revert to some other kind of public purpose. California was very fortunate uh, compared to some other states that those monies went into, in fact, two health foundations. Uh, we have a sister foundation, uh, the California Healthcare Foundation, based in San Francisco, uh, that is also one of those conversion foundations. In a state like New York, some of the money uh, from their conversions ended up in the Rhodes Fund of their state government and didn't get back to health. Uh, so California is very important. Yeah, tell them how much money is in the foundation. Uh, currently, um, we have the endowment is a little over $4 billion. Uh, which means that we are able to give out every year uh, in the area of a couple hundred million a year. Now, it sounds like a lot of money, and four billion sounds like a lot, but you've, you've, you've heard the budgets that, that, we, that you manage on the public side. Uh, it really pales into comparison to the annual budget of a health department. So foundations are all about innovation and leverage. Uh, what we, and this gets to why I came after 20 years in public service. Uh, a foundation like the California Endowment uh, really has no constraints except that we make impact on areas of significance to the health of Californians, that we drive toward our mission. And we have a very broad mission to try to improve the health and well-being of all Californians, but particularly to improve the health of populations that are marginalized because of race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, uh, who unfairly do not get the access to health care that they need. So this is a, since we like to think about uh, philanthropy as being like a societal passing gear. You can innovate very quickly. You aren't tied into some of the same kind of cycles uh, of decision making that often occur in the public sector. And you can really try to be on the cutting edge of change. I want to mention that we believe that mobilization and at the grassroots level, at the community level, and mobilization at the treetops level, policy and decision makers, is absolutely at the core of how we believe we improve the health and well-being being of all Californians. So on your theme of mobilization, the California Endowment believes this is a real driver in philanthropy. We call it our theory of action. Philanthropy has lots of internal theories, but our theory of action says whether you're talking about access to health care, whether you're talking about developing a more culturally competent health care system and a more diverse 
workforce that goes with that. And if you're talking about eliminating health disparities that are growing in Los Angeles, uh, in communities, diabetes, uh, asthma, a variety of conditions that are uh, exacerbated in, in marginalized communities, you figure out long-term solutions, not just by incremental services, by recognizing what systems have to change, what policy has to change, and bringing grassroots and trees hops together. Both of those mobilization efforts have to occur if you want to get sustained change. So uh, that the ability to be part of an organization that is, dr is driven by impact at the cutting edge of innovation, uh, working with partners in communities as well as partners in decision making uh, and policy positions, that's kind of the excitement uh, that, that brought me from the public yeah, but sector. but you were like the top honcho in King County. I mean, you could have done, like, you were the boss. Well, and, and I can also my other my other colleagues who've been working in county government. I mean, there there is there there is for, for me. I was very exciting uh, running the Boston Health Department. And it was very exciting running the King County Health Department. We did a lot of work in the homeless. King and County is Seattle. King County is Seattle, Washington. Yeah. Washington. Um, but there's a kind of a life cycle of your profession. Um, I'd been there about 10 years and um, had a chance with a, a wonderful staff. You know, we had a staff of 2,000 people, and this was a health department that uh, ran direct services in community clinics, homeless shelters, as well as some of the preventive public health services that Deanna mentioned. Um, had a chance to do some, as I was telling uh, before the, uh, this, this presentation, had a chance to do some things like stop the county from building a new jail and putting those money into preventive services for homeless populations and substance abuse and mental health populations because we found that the jail, that we ran jail health services in my health department, we found that 70% of the people in the jail were there because of a mental health, a substance abuse, or dual diagnosed problem. So it made much more sense than to build an expensive jail that cost $25,000 per person per year, more than college, uh, to... Not at Loyola Marymount. Yeah, yeah, not here, not here. I know, I have a, I have a, a high school junior Junior that's looking at colleges, so I'm very sensitive to price points, and I know this one. Yeah. <laughs> I know this one, uh, but uh, but it's worth every penny. But it's I'm I, I, I'm sure I'm sure it is I'm sure it is. But again, we you know. Um, uh, Again, so, but, and there's certain kind of impacts you can have at that level, but there's another kind of impact you can have as being a catalyst for change in a state uh, as dynamic as California, in a county and city as, as dynamic as Los Angeles. And I think the role that we play as a convener, as a catalyst, as an innovator, as a partner, uh, is another way to improve the public's health that I think augments uh, yeah. what I've done on the public side. And right. this, it, it, just for the students here, it's good to have uh, applications of your interests and passions in different ways along your career. Sometimes you find path. I would never have thought I would have been uh, a philanthropist when I was a young epidemiologist. <laughs> also, it rains a lot less in LA than Seattle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what was your most frustrating experience being the head of the uh, public health in Seattle, King County? My most frustrating experience um, was sometimes uh, how much time it took to raise the urgency of public health issues uh, in, in the context of the elected officials that I worked with. Um, sometimes uh, it was difficult to raise the urgency of, and the changes of the HIV AIDS epidemic so that we could change our programming so we could meet the new uh, uh, urgencies of that problem. Uh, as Diana mentioned, one of the more frustrating things, frustrating and opportunities, was trying to keep the traditional parts of public health, uh, improving physical and mental uh, well-being, uh, core prevention of infectious diseases to keep that whole while the whole uh, additional burden of bioterrorism and uh, and that funding began to change some of the, the balance of what we could do, keeping a balanced health department where you can work on those issues of bioterrorism, but you don't lose the community connections and the community preventive aspects. Uh, that was a challenge and sometimes a frustration as well. Um, and sometimes I think from working at the local level, the county and, and city level, sometimes a, a frustration uh, that uh, the perspective of state and local is not embraced as, as much as you should should be from some of the national policy. Yeah. So is all this money going to bioterrorism wasted money? And I'm going to ask Diana the same question to comment. I mean, it's... And it, the, the art of that frustration... Now, about bioterrorism is yeah. the, the fear that 
either some accident or some terrorist would use something like that, or maybe even the avian flu or something of that nature is what we're, to be prepared for that. It'll be interesting to hear both of our perspectives on that. I, in, in my experience, and Deanna, you, you, had, you were doing this at the same time, the, uh, a lot of doing good public health is the art of trying to make the funding that comes down from various sources really match the problem as you see it, and which may not be the same way that the funders do. And so initially the money that was, and, and it was nationally built, uh, large amounts of money, billions of dollars, that was aligned to bioterrorism, um, would not was very difficult to integrate into what public health departments did best, and so I I think that the money, the best kind of preparedness is when you build strong communities, when you have a strong set of infectious disease control, uh, the kind of things that work for controlling communicable diseases like influenza and being able to get flu vaccine out in a yeah, responsible, timely way. Yeah, but but those same mechanisms, that same capacity to deal with the infectious diseases that are more ordinary, are similar to the ones you would need to ramp up if you were unfortunate enough to have a smallpox used as a weapon. So I. I think uh, the key, I felt, uh, with the bioterrorism money was to build what we used to call dual use, that you didn't kind of have a whole lot of money for bioterrorism, like sitting in behind glass at a firebox that you only break when you get the out when you get bioterrorism, but you put it into use around the more common uh, community building work you need to do. Uh, when you think about preparedness, it's not just being prepared for bioterrorism, but you think about the lessons of Katrina. You need to be prepared for natural disasters, and that involves understanding the kind of pressures that communities are under when they're not in an outbreak situation. Situation. So the money can the money in many health departments have been very creative at aligning those to ways that get at some of the day-to-day -day issues. So you're not just uh, sort of storehousing those resources for so, bioterrorist outbreaks. So we we'll Diana. But so you never answered the question though. Is, was it a waste of money or not? I I I, I think when uh, the, the public health and health component of it was not wasted money. I have my own opinion so about it some of, so some it wasn't of, wasted. No, but I have my own opinion about some of the money that went into the criminal justice. In and policing side that bought equipment that may not have had as much applicability to the kinds of outbreaks you'd expect. Diana? So maybe I won't be as politically correct in terms of um, sort of talking from now a vantage point of being uh, not being in government right now. Um, you know, I, I would agree with Alonzo that, um, you know, the, the money that has poured into the bioterrorism efforts. How much are we talking about? Do we know? Oh, I mean, we're talking about millions, it, and millions, millions and millions, you know, right now. Um, has been useful because I think, I think the students need to know. I mean, public health departments were never funded at the level that they should have been. So you put on top of it this need to suddenly have this 24-hour vigilance and be able to respond at the same level that the police department or the fire department could, there is no way possible that public health departments could do that. So there had to be this infusion of money. And in that sense, it's been good because I'll, I'll relate back to when I first started with the city of, of Long Beach, it was in 1988, but we had one computer for the entire health department for the city of Long Beach in the health department. And that was strictly for finances and about two people knew how to use it. We had such an old building at the time, and certainly we progressed past it, that we uh, used to, in order for patients to give a good hearty cough so we could get a good specimen, we would take them to the roof of the building because the facility was so broken down that you didn't want to have somebody in close proximity where they might be um, able to be in contact with tuberculosis. So these were the kinds of things that were happening, you know, that we were talking about archaic systems. Now, what worked and what didn't work in that? Well, I just think if that same amount of money, if we could put just a fraction of that money into violence on a daily basis, you know, how many kids die from violence on the streets? How many children are hungry? How many um, diabetics don't have access to health care? And so you have to weigh those out, and then you start saying, well, is this the way to go? When I was director of the health department, I remember getting a phone call from Tommy Thompson, who was the Secretary of Health, and all the health department directors from the 50 states and the territories as well. We were on this 11 o'clock at night emergency phone call, and it was to be notified that President Bush at the time decided that we were gonna do a smallpox vaccination program. 
And so we started looking about how to do that when there had been no cases of smallpox in the United States for many, many years. And in fact, we had a vaccine that hadn't been used in what, about 20, 20 30 years? years. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me, to let look me get at this it. straight. We do a whole national policy of vaccinating the population against something we haven't seen in how many years? Well, it was in 25 20, years 20 at years. least. You know, we had had fortunately no cases. In so fact, in the world. There weren't any cases. <laughs> in the world. So what prompted and, this? And we have not, just to clarify, Fernando, so people can understand, we have not vaccinated. There hasn't been, there wasn't an, an implementation of a program to vaccinate everybody. What they did decide on is to look at the first responders so that there would be a core of people that had received the vaccination so that if there were the unthinkable that we had uh, a terrorism activity that would spread the disease, because that would be the only way that we would be seeing this in the United States, that there would be a core of responders. So for instance, I got vaccinated as part of that program. So were you lucky or unlucky? <laughs> Uh, well, bo both. Both is really the truth of it because, you know, um, you know, there were some thinking that's a good thing because you could then be on the front line and, and be there prepared and bad in terms of, you know, we really didn't know was this going to affect other individuals. I had at the time, my mom was living in my household and she was in her uh, late 80s and so there was concerns about somebody that either was immunocompromised or frail and elderly or the very young that we didn't know, could there be some form of transmission or could there be other side effects that we just weren't as cognizant of that maybe occurred in the 1950s when the last rounds of um, the smallpox vaccination was given, but that people really didn't understand at the time that these effects could occur. So has, have we had a bioterrorism incident in California? No, we no. have not. And given your professions, I know you're not terrorism experts, but what is the likelihood? I think that'd be impossible to, to answer. I, you know, I certainly, you know, um, should we be ready? Should we have uh, health systems, um, certainly public safety, uh, be cognizant that things can happen in this world? Yes. You know, but, but maybe it's the bird flu that we yeah. need to be more prepared for right. in terms of the global uh, global warming and what's that going to cause, exactly. Alonzo? Exactly. It's the same thing. I mean, uh, what are, the Katrina example in on the Gulf Coast told us that we need to be just as concerned about natural disasters or even more so than, than sort of the probability of well, a, earthquake. a terrorist We're going to have an earthquake. Earthquakes, uh, the levees uh, around Sacramento and the central. I mean, there are a variety of other scenarios that are important risk factors. And the interesting thing from a public health practice side is that some of the preparedness that you do for those, for those natural disasters are the same kind of things that you really need to do uh, if you really were going to do bioterrorism effectively. I mean, can, uh, uh, and Diana, I'm sure you're, Diana, your experience was the same as mine. Uh, uh, the federal plans for bioterrorism uh, pr uh, protection assumed that people would just follow the directions of federal, of federal and state officials uh, without any context, without proper uh, inter uh, interpretation and materials in a variety of languages, and without bringing in trusted members of communities uh, that an individual would look to to see uh, that they would, in fact, be doing something self-protective I mean, and not harmful. Because some of the messages that come in around bioterrorism and terrorism for a so-called dirty bomb, a bomb that's got some radioactive material, which is one terrorist scenario, you're supposed to stay in place. That seems counterintuitive, uh, yeah. that you shelter in a building than you are, and if you don't yeah, I'd run, I'd run yeah, as, you, as Most possible. people would run, yeah. and you would need to have a lot of engagement with the community before that event uh, to trust that kind of message. So um, I always felt that if you really wanted to have uh, protection against bioterrorism, you would do a lot of community building, you would do a lot of of, of, of networking at a local level. Uh, you would have federal and state and all public health officials understand the logic and the trust mechanisms in communities so that when a disaster hit, you would have a network to work with. Yeah. Dr. Souther, you have a $1 billion budget and um, Dr. Plow here's got $100 million. But your $1 billion, so next year, what is your flexibility that you could actually, of uh, that one billion, spend differently than you're spending today? Of that one billion dollars, the flexibility that we have is probably minuscule because uh, 
Um, Minuscule meaning? Very small. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was an Excuse SAT me. question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, how, how much? 25 million. 25 million, that's like, that's less than two cents of a thousand dollars. It's it's it is minuscule, but but the thing that we I do have some um, flexibility on is not that money that's currently in my budget, but the Mental Health Services Act money that will be in my budget. So starting this spring, we're going to be planning for a prevention and early intervention strategy from Mental Health Services Act that will give us the ability to deal with that issue I told you about turning people away because they weren't sick enough, and even more, going out and doing those things that may prevent somebody from uh, being damaged by mental illness in the first place. So we're going to have probably something in the neighborhood of 60 to $80 million annually available for prevention and early intervention. That hasn't really been committed yet in terms of programs. No, we haven't, we haven't actually even gotten the final rules for planning from the state. Right. The rules from planning will, will get in June. Then starting this summer, we, we will engage the community in trying to help us devise what strategies, who should be our partners. Um, the endowment and Kaiser uh, Health Department will all be our partners in the planning for what we do. And then we look at what would we do to try to intervene to prevent people from being damaged by mental illness. What are the ways that we could work with universities? Because a lot of times people have their first serious mental health episode. When around, they go to, around finals. Well, <laughs> when they go, to, go away to school. Right. I mean, it's really not school. It hap it's just the age at which those, uh, those illnesses tend to manifest. And if we can inter one of the things we know is the earlier the intervention, the less damage done to that person's life. So if we can intervene earlier, People don't end up homeless. They end up having a serious mental illness, but it's, mental illness can be treated. There are things you can do to help people live regular lives living with their mental illness. So, so I, we will have some money, and I hope to engage uh, all of Los Angeles in the pr process of planning for that. Okay, but the earlier $1 billion, very inflexible. And very, going, going back to... Uh, Dr. Plow's 100 million, which some of, a lot of it is already committed, but they have a much greater flexibility. And he talked about innovation and leverage and his ability to be able to do that. I'm gonna ask you a question and then have Elizabeth also respond from her policy area. What would you have the California Endowment and Dr. Plow do right now that if he had 10 to $15 million to spend over the next uh, three to four years. That, that's not a lot to ask for him. That's like three or four million dollars a year. Well, just, just to set the tone of the question, we're in the middle, we're actually two-thirds of the way through our strategic planning process that I'm doing for the, for the next 10 years. And that's a two billion dollar question. That's how much money right. we'll give out. So give, yeah. me, the, give me the advice for, right. our, for strategic planning. <laughs> right. And, 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 <laughs> right, right. And, and we get, and the university <laughs> gets, the university sure gets 10% percent finder's fee. Right, right. For, yeah. So, so, so in the context of having to make a decision like that, that would be. But you know, you talked about the lack of coordination between the new monies and the old monies. What would you have the endowment help you with right now, even though it's not, won't, in the, that context won't be a lot of money, it's very important, innovative money. What, what would you ask them to do? Oh, me? Yeah. What yeah I would, here's your opportunity. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I would ask the endowment to find ways of bringing together the, the, the strands of our health treatment system that have been uh, torn apart. So, for example, physical health care, mental health care, substance abuse treatment are, in, for the most part, in their separate silos. There are wonderful opportunities that could be created so, by that, funding collaborative models. If, if the endowment could, could say, take the top thousand mentally ill persons who also have a serious physical health Ill, uh, issue and substance abuse, and let's devise a joint way. Kind of, of a pilot program. Pilot program of using our resources to treat those people in the best possible way. I believe those thousand people or whatever the number is would get have much better clinical outcomes and the public would save hundreds of millions of dollars. So then if you were to prove, if you were to get this pilot project, do it and show some results, we would then have to change regulations and laws though, right. correct? Which is our, which is our 
theory of action that you, that you innovate and demonstrate in order to change those systems, right? So then the role of the endowment really is to fund these pilot programs that then show bureaucracies, whether governmental or otherwise, that things can be done differently and have your resources go in that direction. Exactly, because at $200 million a year, that's not a, you know, that pales in comparison to a service delivery system that's governmentally funded. So we have to pick our, pick our places and really try to innovate what we think systems and policy changes are possible, to make examples that can be generalized. Because the real money, I mean, you have the real sustain, su sustainable dollars. Right. So a, a foundation tries to lever policy changes in the political environment so you're able to align your dollars in ways that are, that ma that are innovative, which okay. are, there are maybe right. current constraints where you can't. Okay, Elizabeth, right. how, mu how much do you want and what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes, making a list here. Um, you know, I can't agree with uh, Dr. Southern more. You know, and from the I thought we were going to have some controversy. No, 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 I can't I, agree I with him. I have another idea, but uh. no, I, I totally agree with him. Uh, from the homeless perspective, we need exactly what he's talking about, and bringing developers, housing developers, to the table to bridge. Um, you know, the need for housing and the need for this integrated service model for. Uh, homeless and really, you know, it's not just homeless. I mean, it's vulnerable populations. All have very. What's the very definition of a vulnerable needs. population? Um, indigent population, folks with multiple complex psychosocial needs, uh, mental health, uh, you know, special needs populations, disabled, you name it. Um, but we actually are asking the California Endowment and Kaiser for money for a project that uh, is called United Homeless Healthcare Partners, which I. Um, How much are you asking them for? <sighs> A few million. Come on, more. They can give you uh, more than that. <laughs> and it's something how, how I How much are you asking them for? Two million? I, I really don't. I, okay, yeah, something like make that. Make it up. About okay, two million. Three, two million. Like a million a year. Okay, a million um, a year. And it's a project that we implemented uh, in November 2005. Actually, I started and brought all the homeless health care providers together um, in L.A. County who obviously have mutual interests, and this sort of gets at, you know, how do we do the grassroots and the treetops? Uh, it's bringing all God, those. He was just talking about that I too. Know. How could he not fund that? Okay, go ahead. Um, together and to discuss areas of mutual interest. And one of the, um, you know, largest things that we found that everybody has a mutual interest in terms of providing homeless health care services is how do we get from um, the feds, from the state, more ways to be reimbursed for homeless health care, which is very, very challenging. Uh, in California, there are other jurisdictions. So reimbursed, meaning reimbursed from who? From the state, either a Medi-Cal or, you know, a third party. So the city or the county provides a service and you want the state to pay you back for providing that Absolutely. service. Absolutely, and we want to find ways to make that happen. So we, um, you know, are doing some looking at different policy issues and possible legislative issues that we can tackle uh, together. Mm -hmm. So you bring stakeholders together and you find a mutual interest. And this was it. I mean, we basically left it open to them to say, what are the areas you really want to work on that you think that we together as one single voice can work on? And this was huge. So um, this United Homeless Healthcare Partners, we've been, we had strategic planning firm that were overseeing um, all of our meetings and our work groups. We're also working at improving service delivery for homeless health care throughout LA County. Every community is very different and has different needs. Um, and so now we're asking California Endowment and Kaiser to help us staff that effort. Sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> Diana, uh, how much are you in for? Dr. Plow, how much are you in for? Well, Libby knows that we are, have this fantastic partnership. Yes. Just in the last year, Kaiser has spent $1.2 million on uh, issues related to the homeless. And we have Absolutely. a project right now but that But this is we've... above what they're spending, right? This is above the 1.2. Yeah, but they're, you know, they've been, actually, Kaiser's been great, and they're considering our new proposal. Yeah, but we need and more money. And they've already funded us for a number of projects. Okay. We're going to be us, there. We're going to be there for so many of the projects. We partner on uh, uh, working, certainly, on discharge planning. We've been partnering in terms of uh, working with uh, John Wesley Health Institute and other community-based organizations because you know, the solutions are in the community, and it's really for those of us that are here to partner with those community groups. They have the wisdom of knowing what the needs are of the population and how best to approach it. When we partner with the California Endowment, again, it's to look at what are the best things that work there? What are the models that the community teach us are the right things to do? When we partner in the mental health area, Tarzana Treatment Center, other centers that are there in the community, again, 
they're the ones who lead the way. So it's, it's a privilege to be able to provide the funding. And so, we want ahead. something from the endowment that's even more than their money. Uh, we want their uh, leadership and political prestige because, for example, the governor is doing, or at least thinking of doing a health coverage plan. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found out today, there was a request for what would the numbers be if Medicaid were changed, the Medicaid waiver for California was changed so that it would cover single adults in poverty. And that would provide a funding source for the lot of, uh, a lot of the people that Libby and I end up serving in our system now as indigents, they would have a payer source for what they're doing. And the message that we would like the endowment to say would be, first, that's a really good idea, and the net effects for society would be to save money. You know, because those single adults cost in jails, in hospitals, in emergency rooms, a lot more than they would cost if they got regular health care. Which is, I think, a very important point that it's not just the funding of the grants. I mean, philanthropy is really a, a, effective philanthropy is about making change. You can do that through your convening, through your partnerships, through targeted advocacy. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just about service funding, but it's creating the kind of policy environment so that uh, decisions can be made to support the, the, the kinds of approaches that are going to best serve the communities that we, that we want to help improve their health. And that's not always through a service grant. It can be through a, a, a more a grant that helps to improve the policy environment so better decisions are made and that we can uh, put our, our uh, stamp behind as well. Libby, you have I, I was just going to say it's also not necessarily about money. Sometimes it's about building bridges and collaborating and finding ways to bring different services together, to integrating services that are already being provided. Is that, is, that a, is that a data issue? Is there like a, a master health data system at the county that tracks what you do, what mental health does, what public health does, what, every, what everybody else is doing? No, but we're working No, on but it. we're trying. <laughs> oh, this is... One, one of the things that the health department and, and the mental health department did was to track our highest utilizers, those who cost each of the systems the most. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the data for substance abuse, so we couldn't look at that. But we, we tracked the 5,440 highest utilizers and found in our two systems for an 18-month period, there were uh, charges for those people in excess of $298 million. So they were one-third of... Of your budget? Well, this is an 18-month period, oh, and this so, okay. is from both departments, but, so were, but it's a huge expenditure for 5,440 people. And so 5,000 would be what percent of your users or what percent of your clients? Well, they uh, 5,000 would be less than 2.5% of my caseload. So 2.5% of the population were using over 20% in rough figures of the budget. Correct? Well, these are from both the no, I know, my but even budget doing the numbers, and the health even, department even, budget. I, at but, first I was at one-third, but then when you're saying both and all that in 18 months, it's still roughly around 20%, but which is not unusual because in a, in, a, in a regular hospital in terms of what we consider regular health, the, the, the top 5% end up using a lot more percentage of the resources as well. So, but, and so what was the conclusion there? Was the conclusion that the 2% are using 20% of the healthcare system or the, of your budget and therefore we got to do X, Y, or Z? Or what, 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 what did you do with that? What we've been trying to do with that is to do uh, joint case management. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what we're doing and what the obstacle was. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we're doing is try to, trying to do joint case management for those people so that, so that the schizophrenic with diabetes can be tracked both together so that both kinds of medication are taken. So we're, we're, we're developing plans with the health department to do that more effectively. But the first obstacle we ran into were our lawyers told us that we couldn't talk to each other about particular cases because it would violate state and... HIPAA. Well, it, not so much HIPAA, actually it was state confidentiality rules that were even more an obstacle than HIPAA itself. And it was just flabbergasting that, you know, uh, the health director and, and I were at one point reduced to deputizing each other as officials in each other's department so that we could look at the data. It was uh, odd. Um, yes, Diana. Just, Fernando, maybe to segue into, you were asking about data, and, you know, Marvin is really talking about the difficulty that we experience in the healthcare 
in totality that we're not sharing enough information. There aren't the systems set up. I mean, we don't have electronic data systems all the time that talk to each other. I think about Kaiser, eight million members throughout the country, and we just put into effect the first in the nation to do electronic medical records. An enormous undertaking, about $4 billion spent on it. Now we're gonna translate that technology to our community partners so that we're starting with the endowment, with the Tides Foundation, to be able to get together, just in California, 400 community clinics that they need to bridge into having electronic medical records as well. Why? Because we're not in isolation. All of our healthcare systems eventually have to talk to each other. We have to refer mental health patients, the homeless, et cetera. And until we get some of these systems in place, we're gonna have this chaos continue. But it's not a technology issue because we have the technology, we know how to do that. It's a political will issue of putting the money in there, prioritizing it and, and doing this. And especially mental health and homelessness gets put down on, on, the, on the priority list because they don't have the constituents, quote unquote, who vote and who uh, are, are present in the, in the political process. But it's not all, I don't think it's only just the political will because I think that, you know, frequently you don't want to see the money that would have gone to service go into other kinds of system infrastructure. Right. And so, so we have a reluctance to do that. Right. Okay, I'm gonna end with this question and then open it up to the students. There's a health care crisis in America. We continue to hear that. We hear about trauma centers closing. We hear about King Drew. Uh, I mean, every time you talk about this, the, you know, the, the doctor, the, the medical schools, every time you turn around and you talk health, it's crisis, it's bad, it's, you know, getting worse, it's costing more. You know, it, uh, uh, the elderly can't afford their, their uh, um, prescriptions. What are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's going on? Any general observation about the health care crisis? Well, I'll just talk about the mental health side of that and tell you that in California, that in general, the mental health system in the U.S. doesn't work very much better than the general health system. In California, for this moment, we have a chance to change that. Because of the Mental Health Services Act, the Mental Health Services Act will pump uh, that was 2004? It passed in 2004. The first programs are beginning to be operational in various states for what we call community services and supports, which is the, the programs for people who are already disabled by their mental illness. And then the prevention and early intervention, there's an IT and technology comp plan, a workforce development plan. All of those monies have yet to be released. but. Putting those together, if we put those together in the right way, we can really build a mental health system in California that makes sense. Uh, I think we're the only place in the country that really has, uh, has both resources and an attempt to, to really transform and rebuild our system. And LA County is the largest administrative unit. I know there's some states, but the counties typically do this throughout the, the country. So if we can do it in LA County, Right, right. And, and, and actually people from all over the world are looking at the transformation that we're trying to create here, thinking that you know, if, if it works, if we can make it work, it will be a model that will be used internationally. Wow, that's a lot of pressure on you. It is. Yeah. So let me get some, uh, well, any comments about the healthcare crisis? Well, I, I agree. You know, we have two million people in California that are uninsured. We see uh, the closure of about 60 emergency rooms in the last uh, decade here in California. We um, are seeing the increase in type 2 diabetes amongst young children that never should have this experience. I mean, we're talking about the fact that we're probably going to have kids that um, die before their parents if they continue to eat the junk food and to not have good, healthy um, habits in terms of nutrition. But, you know, there are also... I, I still have optimism. I mean, we've been able to see that we can tackle some of these issues. Good public policy that Alonso was talking about is at a core of this. These forums allow us to talk about it, get the invigoration of um, certainly the class here in terms of solutions out there. I showed a, a brief clip at the beginning here. It was showing uh, Mayor Villaregosa uh, just this past summer, and he was talking about a program called Operation Splash, it was a program in which Kaiser funded uh, $1.2 million, 44 swimming pools in the city of Los Angeles with partnership of Parks and Recreation. Why? They said they had trouble 
paying for a lifeguard, paying for chlorine for the swimming pools, and as a consequence, many children in low-income neighborhoods were not able to have physical activity. I mean, how can we say, let's change this t diabetes without having this? So this intervention allowed 8,000 kids to learn how to swim this summer. So awesome. I think we can do lots of things like this in the community. Yeah, but we have this health care crisis, but aren't we healthier? Aren't we living well, longer? Well, uh, let me pick up on, on that. I mean, we, we have a health care crisis because we have an illness care system. And so to call it a health care crisis, we don't do as much health care as we, as we should. And um, as Dean was saying, there, there are wonderful innovative models where we know that in communities in the California Endowment Fund, something called uh, healthy eating, active living uh, programs where uh, if you can provide you know, fresh fruit and vegetables in a neighborhood, if you, if you can mobilize uh, parents uh, to uh, improve school policies so the school lunch programs are healthier, I mean, you, can, you can prevent diabetes and some of these diseases that if left unchecked, uh, or allowed to get to the stage of a disease, uh, manifest disease, there are better ways to do that with the prevention. So part of the healthcare crisis is not taking opportunity of community-based prevention, thinking about what the wellness pathways are. The good work that Kaiser's doing on the Thrive Campaign is a major part of that. But it will, you know, we, we think, and certainly the endowment, that you need to reform the reform debate. So you're not just talking about what the crisis as uh, how much you're paying for uh, services, but the crisis is not being prevention driven as much as you need to be community driven and then on the institutional side that you are patient focused and uh, patient centered and quality uh, focused in your services. So it, it's kind of reconceptualizing what we're doing and not just a crisis of how you pay for what we're doing. And maybe stress A lot of people don't even have insurance. So you've, you touched on like, you know, the pool aspect and, and can we really sustain this when, you know, we don't even have the ability to sustain those that need illness care? You know, that's my, I don't know if you yeah, understand my yeah, question. He's talking yeah. about the crisis again. Right. Mm -hmm. Any response? Yeah, I think, uh, I think your question kind of illustrates that you can't, the, 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 the dilemma that was, is facing my department currently. We can't do the early intervention work without diverting the resources that are already just barely maintaining those with serious mental illness. So it, it really takes a retooling of the whole system to invest the resources on the front end but it must be done because even with Mental Health Services Act, if I got $250 million more a year and invested that all on hospital and other care for people who are already seriously disabled, the caseloads would keep on building. Those, those resources would all be silted up and I would be in the exact same position I am now, only with a bigger system. So we need to, we need to we need to get more resources, but invest them in transformation so we can invest in that front-end care for people. I'd say that, you know, when you talk about prevention, it's got to get very personal. You know, if people would do one of five things, know their numbers, which is what's your cholesterol, what's your weight, what's, you know, when were the times that you came in for the uh, preventive care in, into your physician's or practitioner's office, you know, know your family history. Do you have diabetes in your family? Do you, do, did uh, someone die of heart disease, uh, breast cancer? Well, you know, I, I just want to make sure that the students get this because this sounds like a good final, final exam kind of five IT Five points, question, right? right? Five points. So what are the five again? <laughs> know your numbers. Know your numbers. Know your family history. Mm -hmm. know, have good nutrition. Exercise. These are easy things. Mm -hmm. And have a relationship with your health care provider. Yeah, so five, have you never... that's the fifth one is that, you know, to come into a system to seek care, not when you're in the need of an emergency visit, but early on so that there is an ongoing relationship so that you're preventing the kind of illnesses that cost a fortune and that ultimately costs human life. Okay. Um, hi. <clears throat> Sorry. You got, the mic. you got the mic. Nobody else can go. <laughs> um, uh, this is touching back to the, your, your problem with the funds. Um, I worked for a drug and alcohol treatment facility as a, a sentencing advocate for drug offenders. I would go in and advocate for them to get sentenced to this drug treatment facility as opposed to uh, jail. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time on the seventh floor of Twin Towers. 
And um, so I saw firsthand the result of a lot of people getting turned away who had a lot of mild uh, mental illnesses. They'd go out onto the street, self-medicate, turn into drug addicts, and then commit crimes. Uh, it would end up overpopulating the jails. And, you know, it's just this vicious cycle. Homelessness. A lot of this stems from uh, an original mild mental illness. And um, I'm just dumbfounded at the inability of uh, a, the, a budget not able to um, focus on, on that population of people coming for help initially and kind of only that ability of your budget to focus on triage, really. And, and I hear your problem. I'm not saying that you're not focusing on that, but m my question really is that you've got, you know, this the new Mental Health Act and $250 million um, allocated for what then if it's not allocated for um, for uh, like, what are the new programs that it's allocated for? Yeah. So, what are you going to do with okay. the money? And there, 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 your par your question really has two parts. There's, because there, there are the programs that have already started and what they are used for, and I can tell you about those. And so, what what our current allocation, which is about ninety million, is what we have already been allocated, and those are used for what we call full service partnerships. That means doing whatever it takes for kids, transition age youth, adults, older adults, their housing needs, their mental health needs, their substance abuse treatment needs, really to do whatever it is to help those people achieve recovery. So that's the centerpiece of what we're doing with this money. Then we're also doing what we're calling systems navigators. Those are people who are assigned in each area of the county to help persons with mental illness and their families navigate the system, not just the mental health system, but the health system to, to kind of get them in touch with whatever resources are currently uh, available. Then we are also setting up uh, four what we call uh, psychiatric urgent care centers. These are places where people can go when they're in a mental health crisis, but it's that's not in an emergency room. It's connected to an emergency room. So the, the one that's closest here, we set up on the grounds of Brotman Hospital. So people in a mental health crisis, or a lot of times it's a substance abuse crisis. And as you know, many times, you really can't tell, tell the difference until you actually do the blood work. And so uh, the Brotman cent the center we've set up at Brotman can handle those people. If it turns out to be substance abuse, link them to the substance abuse program. If it turns out to be uh, mental illness, link them to the mental health treatment program. If it gets into an acute crisis, Brotman's, Brotman and their psych unit is right across the street so they can take them there. So we're starting uh, five of those th in different parts of the county. Um, we are doing what we call field-capable clinical services for older adults because older adults who have mental illness don't want to go to a, to a mental health clinic. They don't want to go to a counselor. So you have to go where they are. So we're providing mental health care in community clinics and senior centers and doctor's offices and so forth as a way of providing care for older adults. And there's, there's a bunch of others, but that's, the, that's what we're starting now. The money that we haven't received yet, so we haven't allocated yet, and we need to plan for are what will we do for prevention and early intervention. And I'll give you one idea as a taste of what we could and, in my view, should do. One of the things that we found out is that kids who have been the victims or the witnesses of trauma experience earlier substance abuse and higher rates of mental illness. And we developed and tested in uh, uh, for LA Unified Schools, a cognitive behavioral treatment intervention that goes over 16 weeks. And kids who have um, been the witnesses or victims of trauma and take that 16-week intervention course, which is a regular part of their school day, have hugely reduced uh, rates of substance use and uh, problems at home, their grades go up, and so it's really a remarkable intervention. With the new money, one of the things we hope to do is to expand that program from these four pilot schools to all over the county. That's an example of the kind of things that we could do with prevention and early intervention. Okay, Cornelius. Oh, Dr. Seller, can you talk about 
relationship with the board of supervisors saying that you report to them and they have no training in psychology or psychiatry? What would you like to see different? Working with the board, would you rather report to the chief administrative officer? Kind of talk about the, uh, the five little kings. <laughs> He's well-read. Yeah, talk, talk about your bosses who review you and give you <laughs> yeah. a raise. Go. This is, no. Uh, the, uh, actually, the Board of Supervisors took action last Tuesday in which they have delegated the hiring, firing, and performance evaluation of the county department heads to the county administrative office. So they've delegated that for the next year or so, and if the experiment works, then their proposal is that they will put on the ballot in July of 2008 a change in the county charter that would make this CAO that changed into a chief executive officer role with the ability to fire and hire and evaluate and motivate the department heads. And, you know, everything in some ways is determined by personality. You get the right gifted person in that role and it will be wonderful. If you get, you know, uh, Genghis Khan, the CEO, it may not be quite as good for department heads. But uh, in general, I would tell you that the current crop of LA County department heads who have experienced things have they, as they have been historically run are looking forward to this new model as a way of, in a way you can think of it as a mechanism for unifying services in ways that hasn't been possible previously. So, and you've been in your position for how long? Eight years. And during that time, how many directors of public health were there? Well, uh, uh, public health, uh, I think there's, well, actually there's been no directors of public health. In the, the health department, uh, I'm on my third health director now. Oh. And the third DCFS director, the third public social service director. So there's- Turnover. There's, there's some turnover. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, go ahead. Um, uh, I just want to thank you guys for um, taking the time out to be here tonight. And also my question was, um, you guys are talking a lot about how California is sort of poised in this position to sort of reformat and to put on a new model. And um, I just wanted to know how does um, undocumented residency or illegal immigration sort of factor into this, into the new health, into the new health care model? What do you, I mean, in terms of mental health or homelessness, well, I, a, I can immigration I can, status impact that? Yeah, I can speak uh, to on the mental health side because it's a much easier problem uh, on the mental health side. Uh, there's a lot of data that shows that immigrants have a much higher mental health status than longtime residents do. I mean, there's some controversy about why that might be and what it is about being a resident that seems to erode mental, uh, so mental that, health. So that is, the more American you become, the more mental health problems you have? Yeah, I mean, that's what the data shows. And physical health. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other thing, uh, the other, because of stigma in immigrant communities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, immigrant communities, particularly Latinos, don't seek mental health services until well, it's really... We don't have that problem in the Latino uh, Yeah, community. right. <laughs> so, uh, so it's really, really... Uh, we don't use many of our services for undocumented currently because undocumented generally don't seek those services. Then the third thing is we don't ask anyway. I mean, so nobody would be turned away from mental health services because of citizenship status or lack thereof. But you know the issue that pe people say immigrants cost, and they cost us in the schools, and they cost us in the health system, and that's been an argument. Is there anything that the endowment has been doing in terms of studying this or taking a look in, in this area? Yeah, the, the endowment uh, is, has done a lot of funding, policy, and advocacy work around immigration reform. Uh, to your question, uh, believing that you really are need, need to have immigration reform if you're going to improve the health of the population in California. So we think that's a major factor that until that, that happens is, is driving lack of access and poorer health outcomes than we would see if there was good comprehensive reform. So we have, a, you know, we fund advocacy groups uh, at the grassroots and the treetop levels that are trying to promote uh, uh, better immigration policy. More questions right here? Wait for the mic, mostly because we're recording it. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how maybe mental health issues 
have increased um, as distribution of wealth in this country has also increased. So kind of looking at the economy. Does poverty lead to greater mental health? Does poverty lead to greater homelessness? Is it in income inequality to your question, like the difference between the high earners and low earners, and has that increases? Is Definitely, that, yes. That's the question. One of the uh, uh, first books I read in graduate school was uh, Red, Red Lick and Hollings Head about basically exactly that issue, whether, uh, whether mental illness was associated with poverty or poverty with mental illness. And the end point was there is more mental illness that is associated with people in the lower quintile, I think was the analysis for, for that work uh, of, of income. But it wasn't exactly clear if there was a causal relationship because it could be that mental, I mean, does poverty cause mental illness or mental illness cause poverty? And so. I think one of the things that we can say for sure, whichever causes it, that when they do the distribution formula for Mental Health Services Act money, they don't do it on a county's, just on a county's general population, they do it on a county's poverty population because issues related to mental illness are more highly concentrated in poverty populations and they are the ones that, that tend to use us. Is in, is, I would say that in general, that is probably more related to a lack of ability to do early interventions and because of traumas than it is to anything else. Okay. Um, I just kind of feel like um, it's becoming more and more competitive to achieve kind of the American dream in this country. And I feel like with my generation, I just see such a huge amount of us being medicated um, for psychological issues. And it's, I feel it's like, are, we're just becoming so enthralled with like trying to be successful, trying to make it, trying to make it, and it's just because it's becoming harder and harder to achieve this dream here. And I, I kind of like that's what I'm kind of thinking about is the whole social social aspect of like sociology aspect of it, kind of. Yeah, I, I think there are some issues related to social pressures. I think there's also issues that are related to uh, familial expectations and you know one of the things that we've sometimes found out is that particularly in, uh, I was mental health director in Kern County. There was a t time in Kern County when the public schools in Taft gave uh, Ritalin to all boys in their schools. Yeah, tell me about uh, uh, so I mean it, it was just, <laughs> In the general policy, boy, troublemaker, medication, quiet. You know, that was, that was the equation they were working on. They got sued and they stopped and so forth. But there, are, um, there have been abuses in which, you know, medications have been used to uh, try to treat and control behaviors that are essentially normal. Yeah, right here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, um, Dr. Bonta, if you could speak to the incident that occurred, I think a few months ago, with um, a homeless person who was dropped off in Skid Row um, from a Kaiser facility. So what kind of factors, um, could you speak to the factors that affect that kind of decision um, to place someone who, um, who was in need of attention um, instead of being able to give them that care, faced with that decision of actually putting them on the streets? Yeah, what happened and what are you guys doing about that? Sure. You know, I, I think uh, this is a, a difficulty in terms of many of us as hospitals and as healthcare systems are there to serve the needs of the, of the public, and we do that in an excellent fashion and every day, but mistakes happen from time to time. In this case, the mistake was that the patient was ready for discharge. Um, they had previously been homeless, so there wasn't a relative or someone to discharge to. There was an agreement with the patient to go to a, a shelter, and in the uh, trying to place that patient into the shelter, unfortunately, they were not properly dressed. It was a mistake. They put them into a taxi cab to go to a shelter. Um, since that time, we've been working with Libby. Yeah, but, uh, but they and, never got to the shelter, right? No, they got to the shelter. The problem was this was uh, someone who was about 62 years old. She she was not properly attired. It was in Skid Row, and there was a video that uh, showed her in front of the facility because the taxi cab driver just let her off. 
And so she didn't know where was she supposed to walk into. She had previously been homeless in an area outside of Skid Row, was not familiar with the shelter environment. And so someone from the shelter did come out, get her, bring her into the shelter. So what happened is a press conference was called by uh, some of the political leaders. And um, I went down to the press conference as the corporate representative. And I apologize sincerely. I'm a nurse by background. Um, it was just devastating for us to see this because we did not feel this met any of our standards. And so we apologized specifically to the patient and to the community at large for making this mistake. Now, what I want to ensure, what all of us want to ensure, is it doesn't happen again. And so that's where we've been working with Libby in terms of the um, Homeless Health Care Agency with LA County, with other agencies, in terms of we have a contract now that we worked with an agency, a not-for-profit agency, that helped design a training for staff at the hospitals. And this is for in the Kaiser system as well as Los Angeles County hospital system because it's not only been Kaiser, but it's been other institutions who had incidences and some more egregious. That doesn't matter. We, we need to solve some of these issues in terms of educating our discharge planners, our medical providers as to what are the resources out there, you know, so that we have guides for them as to what's the proper way to handle this. You know, many shelters close early in the, in the day. Um, the shelters, you know, some don't realize that at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning that they're vacating the people out for the day and that people have to line back up for the day. Many don't realize that if you're a homeless male um, that uh, you can't, there's not a reservation system for you to come into the shelter. You have to line up. So we're working not only on the discharge planning, we're looking at could we have an electronic system that would um, look at the capacity? Where are the beds available in the shelters for the day? How does that match up with the hospital that's discharging? More than that, what if a patient needed follow-up care? Maybe they had an ulcer that needed to be irrigated. Maybe they needed some monitoring. They're not sick enough to be in a hospital because we don't want to use a hospital bed for that where anyone in the community might need that for more serious care, right? But they're still not at a point where they could be at a skilled nursing facility or another institution. So there has been the creation of a new type of bed, recuperative beds it's called, in which a shelter can have a nurse that's hired to be on a 24-hour basis to be able to handle that individual who might be discharged from a healthcare institution and is homeless coming into the shelter. We've been working certainly with the county in terms of the Bell Shelter, looking at a capacity, increased capacity. John Wesley Health Institute at, uh, located in Skid Row, that's part of the Weingart Center, has had 40 recuperative beds. We increased it by five. Libby knows, we all know, we just need tremendous more resources, but there is um, hope. We've been seeing um, progress in this area. We've learned from our mistake. We feel very much that we are part of the community and we should be part of the solutions as well. Libby, is this problem getting better or worse? Well, I think the problem is the same. Uh, since you referenced the uh, 80s and uh, the deinstitutionalization, uh, you know, Skid Row was sort of built by, not built, but identified as an area by the city of LA, their um, community redevelopment agency, as an area for this, for the homeless clientele or the inebriates or what have you. Um, and it's been very, you know, that area known as Skid Row has been pretty much the same over the years until uh, lately. Um, and so, I think what's important to note, and by the way, I'm the Libby she's referencing. Elizabeth is my formal name, so you know there's not another person in the room. Um, At least they'll know we know each other. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, some of the things that are important to note is um, a lot of the clientele we work with at the county don't want a referral. I mean, they don't want us to try to help them. Um, we really go above and beyond trying to encourage them to take referrals and to take our transportation downtown. Our transportation is bus tokens and taxis. The, the shelters don't take reservations, so people line up just like everybody else. So if you've got a camera on a client who gets, you know, let off by a cab who's going to line up. I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that's happening, and it looks bad, but it's not, you know, there's two sides 
to every store, I have to say. The other thing is we have a lot of clients who leave against medical advice, um, and they um, have a right to do that. And they literally, from our LAC um, facility, quite often walk to Skid Row. Um, so it, it's, you know, the, just so you know, there's a lot of, of components to this, to this issue and this problem. Is it, good, is it good to concentrate homeless services in one geographic area that's identified that people know where to go, or should we disperse them into different communities? Well, LA is a large place. Every community is very different. Every community has homeless. Every community needs to have an infrastructure to serve the people that live in their community. So, um, you know, Skid Row was developed to have a place, and that's where a lot of the resources have been centralized, and it's worked up till now. I mean, I'm not. It's not. I'm not saying it's. I'm saying that we have been able to provide people with services there, um, but it doesn't um, address the fact that there is not enough um, homeless services infrastructure throughout LA for um, homeless within particular communities. So uh, it needs to be regionalized. The burden needs to be taken by every you know, community within LA, and there's 88 cities. Yeah, but, but you know that Beverly Hills isn't gonna wanna volunteer or like, I don't know, many of you know, the little city of Bradbury where I think it's against the law to have a house with less than three acres or something like that. Um, they're, they're not going to agree for, to build this infrastructure. They're just going to be very resistant and they're going to want to say, hey, come on, just send it down to Skid Row. It's like it's there and nobody cares, et cetera. So how do you get over that? And what is the current plan to try to decentralize it? Well, you start working with communities that will um, take on some of the burden. Uh, there are definitely going to be those that won't, and you know, Santa Clarita says they have no homeless. So, you know, we're not going to turn them around overnight, and or, nor may we ever. But we do. There are definitely communities who have interest in. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And a lot of communities feel like if we put a center in town, that's going to deal. You know, that's going to have homeless. All these homeless people are going to come. But the reality is, you got homeless. They're you know down the street from me every night. So do I want them sleeping outside with nothing, or do I want them taken care of? Do I want them to be able to go someplace to get supportive services to get help? Um, so, you know, you got a lot of personalities and you have a lot of different political will, um, and it's a very, uh, you know, it's a complicated issue. You know, maybe it's also that people aren't seeing the success stories because, you know, mental health, uh, the village, for instance, where the um, homeless, formerly homeless are working there in projects in the village, uh, Mental Health Association. Where is, where is the village? In Long Beach. And um, they've also done work uh, in when they um, had the Navy reuse of the property in terms of many agencies that came in and provided services. So there are some wonderful projects that are working in the community, and I think the public needs to know more about them so that they can see that there is hope that if you put in this infrastructure that you can get more gains out of it than the negative parts that people believe in terms of NIMBY or not in my backyard. And if your students wanted to see a place like that closer, uh, take a look at OPCC, Ocean Park Community Center, used to be Ocean Park Community Center in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. It really has a wonderful shelter employment program. Uh, it's right, a, right across from, I think, right next to Crosswoods, Crosswood, the Crossroads Road School, and it's you wouldn't guess it's a homeless treatment facility because it's very nicely designed. Wonderful people, outstanding program. Uh, take a look at it if you want to see what a homeless and mental health treatment center can be like. We have quite a time for one or two more questions. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take time away from the students if someone else has a question. But I, I'm just wondering, we've heard from some other panels about um, some of the physical changes going on in Los Angeles. And I'm just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on how the built environment, how the physical environment of Los Angeles, the streets, the buildings, the, you know, et cetera, can contribute to physical health and, and mental health, whether it's, you know, better outcomes for diabetes or preventing diabetes or other health outcomes in general. Yeah, when people talk about healthy communities, what, what is, I mean, what's the definition of health and how does the built environment contribute or detract from that? Why don't we go with uh, Dr. Plow? 
Yeah, just uh, actually, because I, I brought some of those statistics uh, on that. I mean, if you look in LA and you see that you know 40 percent of the deaths in LA County are caused by heart disease and stroke and preventable chronic diseases. I mean, the the, the characteristic of the built environment, the ability to walk safely, the ability to bike, the ability to uh, have parks to exercise, anything that mitigates against sedentary lifestyle is very important. And I think one of the, uh, and Deanna can comment on this as well, one of the most exciting breakthroughs in public health practices in the last couple of years has been the merging of city planners and urban planners and land use decisions and health impact assessments about land use decisions, uh, understanding that those uh, the built environment is a powerful influence on an ability of an individual to, to lead a healthy lifestyle. So I think that it's, it's a particular challenge uh, for, for LA to bring that, um, the, 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 the planning context and the wellness context together. But there's some exciting work being done. LA County Health Department is actually sponsoring a symposium on the built environment and health uh, uh, to, to uh, bring both those groups together. Uh, and certainly if you're gonna if you're gonna reverse the epidemic of obesity in our community, it's gonna be around uh, some issues around land use, around the location of, of grocery stores and green grocers and farmers markets and more neighborhoods and the ability for there to be uh, places to run and walk and, and exercise for adults and children. So in general, yeah, that urban design is key to good health. On the mental health side, I'll say that one of the things we're trying to do right now in the mental health system is transform our system from controlling symptoms to creating recovery and wellness for people. And we haven't yet thought through exactly what that would mean for the architecture of a mental health clinic. So uh, one of the things I hope to do is to have some kind of uh, design program is if we had a mental health clinic and wellness centers, we're trying to develop wellness centers as one of our new ways of providing mental health care where people can get uh, substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, nutrition, exercise, health monitoring, as well as self-help activities all in the same place. How would we design such a place so that we foster that? Because really there aren't such places right now. How would we design them? And if we design them right, might they be community areas of focus as well, because one of the main messages that we want to get across are persons with mental illness are persons first. Their mental illness is a very small part of their life. For most things, they're just like the rest of us. And so uh, reducing that, if we could create these wellness centers in a way to provide access to care, but it also be a focus for community building, that would be the perfect solution. And, you know, we don't know how to do it yet, but that's what we're hoping to experiment with. You know, we're also very cognizant that uh, the physical side, asthma, is um, prevalent in many of our communities where we have seen the results of overbuilding or the fact that we see diminished lung capacity of young children in areas that um, have um, increased um, uh, freeway transportation or that they're very close to um, a coal plant or to trains running nearby carrying products into the harbor area, for instance, is, is one of the things that comes to mind. And we know that there are ways in which communities can band together with assistance, sometimes financially, to do some innovative things. You know, I think of the Moms Brigade, which was a group in uh, central Los Angeles in which the mothers outstation themselves at every corner. Why? To provide safe passage of their kids from one block to the other to get to school in the, mo in the morning. And that's a great thing because then those kids can walk safely. People don't have to be driving them there. And those parents can ha have a sense of community and reliance one mother on the other in order to, as a community, provide for changes in the environment for more healthy lifestyles. Allison? Hi, um, I just wanted to follow up on a question that was asked earlier. Um, I was wondering your opinions on how you feel the increase of undocumented citizens is affecting um, the healthcare providers specifically, um, how that's impacting them. I'm also from Long Beach and I have Kaiser as my healthcare provider. And um, my mother is a doctor there and she shares my frustrations as a patient when it's very hard to get appointments. Um, 
sometimes they have to wait up to three weeks to get one. And I was just wondering if what your ideas are on hey, wait that. Wait a minute, if your mom's a patient, I mean a doctor, you ought to be able to get an appointment <laughs> right away. <laughs> so, but it is, or is have to uh, talk later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the number of immigrants has an impact on health care. Well, it certainly does in terms of language and cultural competency kinds of issues. I mean, a great book for you to read is The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, in which it talks about a uh, Laotian family that ca settles into the Fresno area, and there's a, a child that um, um, has, I'm trying to remember what, uh, epilepsy, and uh, as a consequence, the healthcare system really couldn't deal with the needs of the family in which the family believed that a spirit takes hold of you and that it was a thing to be honored and revered by the family and they couldn't understand why wasn't this family compliant in terms of um, the medications that the physician had prescribed for the child. So I think you do sometimes have a very much of a disconnect. Does that take longer? Sometimes. Does that mean that you have to have people that have skill sets that are different than perhaps we've experienced other times. In Long Beach, there are 40,000 Cambodians, so I would expect that you must integrate the concepts specific to the population. When I was at the city of Long Beach, we, at the city health department, we used to have many Cambodians who would come that needed to have um, medical care in an emergency room, and we noticed they were showing up at the health department, and we said to them, why are you coming here when you should be going to the emergency room? And they said, Dr. Bonta, you have the staff here who can translate. And the hospital didn't. Now this was the county hospital facilities and the other facilities in the, in the area. And so we dispatched our staff to go in the ambulance and go to the hospitals. Well, what it taught all of us as a lesson is that there has to be changes in the system such that we're able to keep pace with the population that presents at that time and to meet their needs. Otherwise, we're not doing good service. It's inherent in health providers to want to provide health irrespective of background or what the situation is. It's just part of their oath. It's part of what, what it means to be a, a health provider. Well, germs have no uh, boundaries. Exactly. So. exactly. So, well, um, if there are no more further questions, I want to thank the panelists for taking time out to be here. We pre really greatly appreciate it. Thank you.